Okay, so the basic question is what is nanoprotonics? And uh, you can see that it's made out of two words, nano and harmonics. So it's basically science of light matter interaction at nanometer scale. And uh, Padmaja mentioned yesterday that uh, uh, you know anything uh, by nano, of course, you mean 10 to the minus 3 of a micron. And loosely speaking, anything which is less than a micron and uh, up to a nanometer or even less than a nanometer, you can classify as a and uh, so <clears throat> nanotechnology basically involves control of matter on nanoscale from a, roughly a micron to 10 to the minus 5 of a meter. And uh, there are many uh, different areas in which nanotechnology is very important. And uh, nano is actually a buzzword these days. You know, there's a uh, uh, lot of applications of nanotechnology. There is some hype, but still, you know, there's a uh, lot of uh, applications. And for obvious reasons, because uh, you know, people want to put more on a uh, you know, smaller uh, area. Okay? And clearly, you want to make circuits they are very small. And any time you have small scale circuits, they are faster. And of course, you want to put more uh, you know, uh, high density of memory. You want to put more you know, uh, on a small, uh, smaller scale memory. And so clearly, uh, that's nano electronics. Nanotechnology, of course, has lots of applications in nanomedicine, and I'll touch upon that also briefly. And uh, uh, the whole idea is that you know uh, these days there is something called targeted therapy. Okay, what that means is that you can have drugs in nanocapsules and make them go and stick to the region of interest, like a tumor. Okay? So rather than uh, your drug you know harming all the neighboring tissue want to specifically target it on the uh, tumor or any place of interest tissue. So that's uh, nanomedicine, I'll talk about that. And then finally, of course, the uh, you know, nanoprotonics, which is uh, And clearly, any time you want to uh, work on nanoscale, you want to work with very, very small materials. So people have developed all types of technologies, you know, say if you want to use very small amount of uh, material. Uh, liquid and then you will have nanopipettes. It turns out that people have made nanopipettes which can dispense zeptoliter drops of liquid. Does anyone know what zeptoliter is? Uh, no. <laughs> I also had forgotten, you know, so I went to the yes, 10 to the minus 7, 7. No, 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 minus 21. Oh, 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 so you can see how small that is, 10 to the minus 21 of the liter. And uh, then of course, uh, you know, all sorts of applications of nanotechnology. You know, uh, Dr. Patra will talk about solar cells. And uh, what people have found is that if you coat the upper surface of solar cell with silver particles, about 10 nanometer in diameter, then you can increase the efficiency of solar cells. And that, that's the big trust, you want to increase the efficiency. And then, of course, people have made nanomagnets and all sorts of things. Okay, uh, you know, Dr. Amirwal was telling us yesterday that uh, often in science we try to mimic nature. Okay, anything that you try to do, if you look carefully, you will find that nature has already done that. And so the same is true with nanoprotonics. You know, uh, this is one example of nanoprotonics in nature. And there are some butterflies, you know, which have uh, nanoprotonic structures in their wings. And how do you know that? Because when they flap their wings, you see the color of the wing change, changes. Okay? So you can see that it's blue here when the butterfly flaps its wings, it's a different shape of blue. Okay? And that cannot be because of a dye. Like, you know, my shirt has blue dye. Okay? Now, I don't know, no matter how I turn my shirt, the color still remains the same. Because you know this works by absorption of maybe red light, reflection of blue light, so that is always the same. But here it is not like that. You know, here the, anytime you, know, you change the surface, the color changes, and that's because of a grating-like structure. I don't know if, uh, if some of you have seen what a diffraction grating is. So if you have seen a diffraction grating, if you move a diffraction grating, you can see the colors changing. Okay, and so clearly. Within the wings of a butterfly, there are diffraction gratings. These are nanoprotonics. 
structure. Of course, this is not the only example. You know, you probably have seen iridescent colors, you know, on, on, on a peak of feathers, okay? Or, you know, uh, you know the feathers of a hummingbird. Okay? So, uh, you know, all that is because there are nano photonic structures, you know, uh, of, So clearly, nature is like, what you might want to think, why, why has nature made something like this? You know, okay, think about that. Okay, uh, another example of uh, nanophotonics that I will uh, try to explain is what uh, Vatraja mentioned yesterday. You know, uh, if you take nanoparticles of semiconductors, they are called quantum dots. Okay, it's because we need to use quantum mechanics you know, to explain the property. And, uh, like say material like cadmium sulfide, indium, uh, and phenide in uh, BS is arsenic, right? It's arsenic in uh, indium phosphide, cadmium selenide. You know, these are all semiconducting materials. And just just by changing the size of these nanoparticles, if you have a colloidal solution of these uh, quantum dots in water, if you shine a certain uh, light of a certain color, they will glow with some other color. Okay. Now, this fluorescence that you get just depends on the size. So, how is that possible? You have the same material, all you are doing is just changing the size from 5 nanometers to 10 nanometers to 15 nanometers, and that changes the color. So, this has obvious applications because you know people have used these things for making lasers of different colors. You know, you want to have lasers which will emit any wavelength that you want. And this is one of the ways that you so uh, I will talk about what is called quantum welding. And uh, this is one other example of uh, you know, use of uh, metal nanoparticles to something for surface enhanced thermal scattering. Actually, there are some students from your own group you know, uh, who are working in this area. Are you with us on Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Raman, but uh, Raman spectroscopy is a technique of chemical analysis. Okay? So, you know, every molecule, let's say I have some molecule, chem or chemical, if I shine laser of one light onto that, people have seen that it emits a slightly different wavelength on the longer side. Okay? And the shift of the wavelength is a, a characteristic of that molecule. Depends on how that molecule vibrates. Okay? So, for like uh, if you have CC vibration, you know, two carbon atoms vibrating, they will vibrate at one frequency. If you have CH uh, vibration, they will vibrate at another frequency. So, depending on what molecule that you are shining on uh, your light on, the emitted spectrum will have some information about that process. Okay? The wavelength will shift to that characteristic amount. And so, this is really the Raman spectrum. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is the Raman spectrum of some molecules, of BMMA. Okay? And these peaks that you see here, they are characteristic fingerprints of that molecule. Okay? Now, of course, this Raman spectrum is a very weak spectrum. It's very difficult to see. Okay? And uh, typically, one photon out of a million, they get converted into Raman. Okay? If a million photons form a, a fall on a molecule, only one gets shifted into the okay? So it's a very inefficient process. But people have seen that if you have nanoparticles of metals, like gold or silver, and if you have <coughs> your molecules sticking on the surface of these uh, metal nanoparticles, then under certain conditions, we can enhance this uh, Raman spectrum millions of times. Okay? That's the reason why it's called surface enhanced Raman spectrum. And it involves nanoparticles of gold and silver. Okay? So we do this in our lab you know, all the time. And uh, you know, here I'm comparing uh, two spectra. This is the ordinary Raman spectrum. It's very difficult to see. You can see that the peaks are very small. And here you have these molecules sticking on the surface of uh, gold or silver nanoparticles. These peaks get enhanced. And this technique is so good that people have been able to detect single molecules by this technique. So obviously, that's the ultimate of sensitivity. Anyway, uh, we'll go into a little more detail 
And uh, yeah, uh, before that, I wanted to mention that you know my presentation is maybe very slightly different from what you have in your courses. And uh, so I will of course uh, skip some slides. I will tell you which slides I will skip. And the reason, of course, is that you know all of you have different levels of preparation. You know, many of these phenomena actually involve quantum mechanics. And uh, I don't know, has, has anyone taken an undergraduate course in quantum mechanics? Okay, you have. To. So obviously, you will follow a little bit more. But you know, I'll make sure that we all get a nice, qualitative picture out of whatever I'm talking. And if you are a little better prepared in mathematics or quantum mechanics, of course, you can see a little bit more detail. And so, uh, I need to you to figure that out. Anyway, uh, so nanoprotonics can be divided into three parts. First, we talk about what is called nanoscale confinement of radiation. And uh, this is uh, also called near field confinement of radiation by squeezing light in nanoscale aperture. You know, so here I have a nanoscale aperture. So let's say the size of this aperture is 50 nanometers. Okay? And I'm trying to squeeze in visible light to that. Does anyone know what is the wavelength of visible light properly? Yeah, a few hundred nanometers, right? And so green light has 500 nanometers. So I'm trying to squeeze 500 nanometer light to a 50 nanometer aperture. Is that possible? No, but uh, we know that. You know, if you, uh, like one nice example I can give you is uh, your microwave oven. You know, we all know that uh, on the door of that microwave oven you have a mesh, right? Wire mesh. Why do we have that mesh? Because we don't want the microwave to come out. And microwaves typically have a wavelength of about a centimeter or a fraction of a centimeter, whereas that mesh has whole size of a millimeter or so. So you can see that the wavelength, anytime the wavelength is bigger than the aperture, it does not come out. So the same thing, of course, is, uh, is true here. So we are trying to squeeze this uh, wavelength. A much longer wavelength to a nanoscale aperture. Obviously, nothing very limit will radiate out of it. Okay? But if you look carefully, you know, if you analyze this carefully, what you will find is that very close to the aperture, you know, this light is trying to squeeze out. Okay? It's trying to squeeze out for a few nanometers, but it does not radiate out. Okay? If you just do the mathematics. Okay? Okay? So, what that tells us is that if I'm very close to the aperture, then I can see that light. I can see that additional electric and magnetic field. And uh, so, uh, actually, with the help of this technique, you can uh, do uh, nanoscale microscopy. Uh, you can actually meet that uh, you know the limit of uh, resolution that Parmeja was mentioning yesterday. That you know, if you have visible light 500 nanometers, you are told in your class that you can only see something of the order of few hundred nanometers. You cannot see nanoscale with this color. Okay? But with this technique, you can see that. Okay? So the reason why you can see that is because you are using near field radiation. Okay? So you obviously the object that has to be seen has to be placed very close to the source. So there are all sorts of possibilities uh, you know, that uh, you can accomplish with uh, the nano. Okay, next we'll talk about is uh, nanoscale confinement of matter. And here, of course, we'll see what happens if you have electrons in, uh, in nanoparticles, say semiconducting particles, or electrons in metal, metal particles. Okay, and then, of course, finally, uh, I don't think I'll talk much about it, but uh, we, uh, we have nanoscale lithography applications of uh, nanoprotonics. Again, from the Japan so anyway, we want to build a sub foundation for nanoprotonics. And anytime you start a new field, it always helps to you know, form analogies with something that you already know. Okay. And so here, I, I will be comparing you know, uh, photonics with electronics. Because it might turn out that you understand a certain phenomena in electronics very well. That will help us to uh, explain a related phenomena in optics. And vice versa also, it might turn out that you understand something very well in optics, 